A helicopter is a type of rotorcraft in which lift and thrust are supplied by rotors. This allows the helicopter to take off and land vertically, to hover, and to fly forward, backward, and laterally. These attributes allow helicopters to be used in congested or isolated areas where fixed-wing aircraft and many forms of VTOL vertical takeoff and landing aircraft cannot perform. The English word helicopter is adapted from the French word hélicoptère, coined by Gustave Ponton de Macourt in 1861, which originates from the Greek helix, helix, spiral, well, convolution, and terran, terran wing. English language nicknames for helicopter include chopper, copter, hello, heli, and Whirly bird. Helicopters were developed and built during the first half century of flight, with the Fock Wolf FW 61 being the first operational helicopter in 1936. Some helicopters reached limited production, but it was not until 1942 that a helicopter designed by Igor Sikorsky reached full scale production, with 131 aircraft built. Though most earlier designs used more than one main rotor, it is the single main rotor with anti-torque tail rotor configuration that has become the most common helicopter configuration. Tandem rotor helicopters are also in widespread use due to their greater payload capacity. Coaxial helicopters, tiltrotor aircraft, and compound helicopters are all flying today. Quadcopter helicopters pioneered as early as 1907 in France, and other types of multicopter have been developed for specialized applications such as unmanned drones. History Early design The earliest references for vertical flight came from China. Since around 400 BC, Chinese children have played with bamboo flying toys or Chinese top. This bamboo copter is spun by rolling a stick attached to a rotor. The spinning creates lift, and the toy flies when released. The 4th century AD Taoist book Bao Puzi by Ge Hong Baopu's master who embraces simplicity reportedly describes some of the ideas inherent to rotary wing aircraft designs similar to the Chinese helicopter toy appeared in some renaissance paintings and other works in the 18th and early 19th centuries western scientists developed flying machines based on the Chinese toy it was not until the early 1480s, when Italian polymath Leonardo da Vinci created a design for a machine that could be described as an aerial screw, that any recorded advancement was made towards vertical flight. His notes suggested that he built small flying models, but there were no indications for any provision to stop the rotor from making the craft rotate. As scientific knowledge increased and became more accepted, people continued to pursue the idea of vertical flight. In July 1754, Russian Mikhail Lomonosov had developed a small coaxial modeled after the Chinese top but powered by a wound-up spring device and demonstrated it to the Russian Academy of Sciences. It was powered by a spring, and was suggested as a method to lift meteorological instruments. In 1783, Christian de Lornoy, and his mechanic, Bienvenu, used a coaxial version of the Chinese top in a model consisting of contrarotating turkey flight feathers as rotor blades, and in 1784, demonstrated it to the French Academy of Sciences. 
Sir George Cayley, influenced by a childhood fascination with the Chinese flying top, developed a model of feathers, similar to that of Lornoy and Bienvenu, but powered by rubber bands. By the end of the century, he had progressed to using sheets of tin for rotor blades and springs for power. His writings on his experiments and models would become influential on future aviation pioneers. Alphonse Penno would later develop coaxial rotor model helicopter toys in 1870, also powered by rubber bands. One of these toys, given as a gift by their father, would inspire the Wright brothers to pursue the dream of flight. In 1861, the word, helicopter, was coined by Gustave de Ponton de Macourt, a French inventor who demonstrated a small steam powered model. While celebrated as an innovative use of a new metal, aluminum, the model never lifted off the ground. Dumcourt's linguistic contribution would survive to eventually describe the vertical flight he had envisioned. Steam power was popular with other inventors as well. In 1878 the Italian Enrico Forlanini's unmanned vehicle, also powered by a steam engine, rose to a height of 12 meters 39 feet, where it hovered for some 20 seconds after a vertical takeoff. Emmanuel Duide's steam-powered design featured counter-rotating rotors powered through a hose from a boiler on the ground. In 1887 Parisian inventor, Gustave Trouvé, built and flew a tethered electric model helicopter. In July 1901, the maiden flight of Hermann Ganswint's helicopter took place in berlin schoneberg This was probably the first motor-driven flight carrying humans. A movie covering the event was taken by Max Skladenowski, but it remains lost. In 1885, Thomas Edison was given $1,000 equivalent to $28,000 today by James Gordon Bennett, Jr., to conduct experiments towards developing flight. Edison built a helicopter and used the paper for a stock ticker to create gun cotton, with which he attempted to power an internal combustion engine. The helicopter was damaged by explosions and one of his workers was badly burned. Edison reported that it would take a motor with a ratio of 3 to 4 pounds per horsepower produced to be successful, based on his experiments. Jan Baril, a Slovak inventor, adapted the internal combustion engine to power his helicopter model that reached a height of 0.5 meters (1.6 feet) in 1901. On the 5th of May 1905, his helicopter reached 4 meters (13 feet) in altitude and flew for over 1,500 meters (4,900 feet). In 1908, Edison patented his own design for a helicopter powered by a gasoline engine with box kites attached to a mast by cables for a rotor, but it never flew. <laughs> First flights In 1906, two French brothers, Jacques and Louis Breguet, began experimenting with airfoils for helicopters. In 1907, those experiments resulted in the gyroplane No. 1, possibly as the earliest known example of a quadcopter. Although there is some uncertainty about the date, sometime between 14 August and 29 September 1907, the gyroplane No. 1 lifted its pilot into the air about 0.6 metres for a minute. The gyroplane No. 1 proved to be extremely unsteady and required a man at each corner of the airframe to hold it steady. For this reason, the flights of the gyroplane No. 1 are considered to be the first manned flight of a helicopter, but not a free or untethered flight. 
That same year, fellow French inventor Paul Cornu designed and built a Cornu helicopter that used two 6.1 meters (20 feet) counter-rotating rotors driven by a 24 horsepower (18 kilowatts) Antoinette engine. On 13 November 1907, it lifted its inventor to 0.3 meters one foot and remained aloft for 20 seconds. Even though this flight did not surpass the flight of the gyroplane No. 1, it was reported to be the first truly free flight with a pilot. Cornu's helicopter completed a few more flights and achieved a height of nearly 2.0 meters (6.5 feet), but it proved to be unstable and was abandoned. In 1911, Slovenian philosopher and economist Ivan Slocker patented a helicopter configuration. The Danish inventor Jacob Ellerhammer built the Ellerhammer helicopter in 1912. It consisted of a frame equipped with two counter-rotating discs, each of which was fitted with six vanes around its circumference. After indoor tests, the aircraft was demonstrated outdoors and made several free takeoffs. Experiments with the helicopter continued until September 1916, when it tipped over during takeoff, destroying its rotors. During World War I, Austria Hungary developed the PKZ, an experimental helicopter prototype, with two aircraft built. <laughs> Early development In the early 1920s, Argentine Raúl Pateras Pescara de Castelluccio, while working in Europe, demonstrated one of the first successful applications of cyclic pitch. Coaxial, contra-rotating, biplane rotors could be warped to cyclically increase and decrease the lift they produced. The rotor hub could also be tilted forward a few degrees, allowing the aircraft to move forward without a separate propeller to push or pull it. Pateras Pescara was also able to demonstrate the principle of autorotation. By January 1924, Pescara's helicopter No. 1 was tested but was found to be underpowered and could not lift its own weight. His 2F fared better and set a record. The British government funded further research by Pescara which resulted in helicopter number no. 3, powered by a 250 horsepower, 190 kilowatts radial engine which could fly for up to 10 minutes. On 14 April 1924 Frenchman Étienne Hermichon set the first helicopter world record recognized by the Fédération Aéronautique Internationale FI, flying his quadrotor helicopter 360 metres 1180 feet. On 18 April 1924, Pescara beat Omichan's record, flying for a distance of 736 metres 2,415 feet nearly 0.80 kilometres or 0.5 miles in 4 minutes and 11 seconds about 13 kilometres per hour or 8 miles per hour, maintaining a height of 1.8 metres 6 feet. On 4 May, Ermishan completed the first 1 km closed circuit-helicopter flight in 7 minutes 40 seconds with his No. 2 machine. In the U.S., George de Bothersat built the quadrotor helicopter de Bothersat helicopter for the United States Army Air Service but the Army cancelled the program in 1924, and the aircraft was scrapped. Albert Gillis von Baumhauer, a Dutch aeronautical engineer, began studying rotorcraft design in 1923. His first prototype, flew, hopped, and hovered in reality on 24 September 1925, with Dutch Army Air Arm Captain Floris Albert van Hei at the controls. The controls that van Hei used were von Baumhauer's inventions, the cyclic and collective. 
Patents were granted to von Baumhauer for his cyclic and collective controls by the British Ministry of Aviation on 31 January 1927, under patent number 265272. In 1927, Engelbert Zaschke from Germany built a helicopter, equipped with two rotors, in which a gyroscope was used to increase stability and serves as an energy accumulator for a glider riding flight to make a landing. Zashka's plane, the first helicopter, which ever worked so successfully in miniature, not only rises and descends vertically, but is able to remain stationary at any height. In 1928, Hungarian aviation engineer Oskor Asboth constructed a helicopter prototype that took off and landed at least 182 times, with a maximum single flight duration of 53 minutes. In 1930, the Italian engineer Corradino Descanio built his DAT-3, a coaxial helicopter. His relatively large machine had two, two-bladed, counter-rotating rotors. Control was achieved by using auxiliary wings or servo tabs on the trailing edges of the blades, a concept that was later adopted by other helicopter designers, including Bleecker and Kaman. Three small propellers mounted to the airframe were used for additional pitch, roll, and yaw control. The DAT 3 held modest phi speed and altitude records for the time, including altitude 18 meters or 59 feet, duration 8 minutes 45 seconds, and distance flown 1,078 meters or 3,540 feet. In the Soviet Union, Boris N. Uryev and Alexei M. Cheremukin, two aeronautical engineers working at the Central Nyerogidrodinamicheski Institute, SARS or the Central Aerohydrodynamic Institute, constructed and flew the Sagi 1EA single lift rotor helicopter, which used an open tubing framework, a four blade main lift rotor, and twin sets of 1.8 meter. 5. 9 foot diameter two bladed anti torque rotors, one set of two at the nose and one set of two at the tail. Powered by two M2 power plants, uprated copies of the GNOME Monosupape 9 Type B2 100 CV output rotary engine of World War I, the Sagi 1 EA made several low altitude flights. By 14 August 1932, Cherimukin managed to get the 1EA up to an unofficial altitude of 605 metres 1,985 feet, shattering Descanio's earlier achievement. As the Soviet Union was not yet a member of the FI, however, Cherimukin's record remained unrecognized. Nicholas Florine, a Russian engineer, built the first twin tandem rotor machine to perform a free flight. It flew in Saint Genesius Road, at the Laboratoire Aerotechnique de Belgique in April 1933, and attained an altitude of 6 metres 20 feet and an endurance of 8 minutes. Florine chose a co-rotating configuration because the gyroscopic stability of the rotors would not cancel. Therefore, the rotors had to be tilted slightly in opposite directions to counter torque. Using hingeless rotors and co-rotation also minimized the stress on the hull. At the time, it was one of the most stable helicopters in existence. The Breguet Durand Gyroplane Laboratoire was built in 1933. It was a coaxial helicopter, contra-rotating. After many ground tests and an accident, it first took flight on 26 June 1935. Within a short time, the aircraft was setting records with pilot Morris Kless at the controls. On 14 December 1935, he set a record for closed-circuit flight with a 500-meter diameter. The next year, on 26 September 1936, Kless set a height record of 158 metres 518 feet. 
And, finally, on 24 November 1936, he set a flight duration record of 1 hour, 2 minutes and 50 seconds over a 44 km closed circuit at 44.7 km per hour, miles per hour The aircraft was destroyed in 1943 by an Allied air strike at Villa Kublai Airport. Arthur M. Young, American inventor, started work on model helicopters in 1928 using converted electric hover motors to drive the rotor head. Young invented the stabilizer bar and patented it shortly after. A mutual friend introduced Young to Lawrence Dale, who once seeing his work asked him to join the Bell Aircraft Company. When Young arrived at Bell in 1941, he signed his patent over and began work on the helicopter. His budget was $250,000 equivalent to $4.3 million today to build two working helicopters. In just six months they completed the first Bell Model 1, which spawned the Bell Model 30, later succeeded by the Bell 47. Autogiro Early rotor-winged flight suffered failures primarily associated with the unbalanced rolling movement generated when attempting takeoff, due to dissymmetry of lift between the advancing and retreating blades. This major difficulty was resolved by Juan de la Cierva's introduction of the flapping hinge. In 1923, de la Cierva's first successful autogiro was flown in Spain by Lieutenant Gomez Spencer. In 1925 he brought his C.6 to Britain and demonstrated it to the Air Ministry at Farnborough, Hampshire. This machine had a four-blade rotor with flapping hinges but relied upon conventional airplane controls for pitch, roll and yaw. It was based upon an Avro 504K fuselage. Initial rotation of the rotor was achieved by the rapid uncoiling of a rope passed around stops on the undersides of the blades. A major problem with the Autogiro was driving the rotor before takeoff. Several methods were attempted in addition to the coiled rope system, which could take the rotor speed to 50% of that required, at which point movement along the ground to reach flying speed was necessary, while tilting the rotor to establish autorotation. Another approach was to tilt the tail stabilizer to deflect engine slipstream up through the rotor. The most acceptable solution was finally achieved with the C.19 MK.4, which was produced in some quantities. A direct drive from the engine to the rotor was fitted, through which the rotor could be accelerated up to speed. The rotor clutch was then disengaged before the takeoff run. As de la Cierva's autogyros achieved success and acceptance, others began to follow and with them came further innovation. Most important was the development of direct rotor control through cyclic pitch variation, achieved initially by tilting the rotor hub and subsequently by the Austrian engineer Raoul Hafner, by the application of a spider mechanism that acted directly on each rotor blade. The first production direct control autogiro was the C.30, produced in quantity by Avro, Liorier Olivier, and Foch Wolf. The production model, called the C30A by Avro, was built under license in Britain, France, and Germany and was similar to the C30P. It carried small movable trimming surfaces. Each licensee used nationally built engines and used slightly different names. In all, 143 production C-30s were built, making it by far the most numerous pre-war autogiro. Between 1933 and 1936, De La Cierva used one C-30A GACWF to perfect his last contribution to autogiro development before his death in late 1936. 
To enable the aircraft to take off without forward ground travel, he produced the autodynamic rotor head, which allowed the rotor to be spun up by the engine in the usual way but to higher than take off R, P, M at zero rotor incidence and then to reach operational positive pitch suddenly enough to jump some 6.1 meters 20 feet upwards. Topic: Birth of an industry. Heinrich Fock at Fock Wolf was licensed to produce the Sierra C.30 Autogiro in 1933. Fock designed the world's first practical transverse twin rotor helicopter, the Fock Wolf FW61, which first flew on the 26th of June 1936. The FW61 broke all of the helicopter world records in 1937, demonstrating a flight envelope that had only previously been achieved by the Autogiro. During World War II, Nazi Germany used helicopters in small numbers for observation, transport, and medical evacuation. The Fletner Florida 282 Colibri Synchropter, Using the same basic configuration as Anton Fletner's own pioneering Florida 265 was used in the Mediterranean, while the Fock Akgelis FA 223 Draca twin rotor helicopter was used in Europe. Extensive bombing by the Allied forces prevented Germany from producing any helicopters in large quantities during the war. In the United States, Russian-born engineer Igor Sikorsky and W. Lawrence Lepage competed to produce the U.S. military's first helicopter. Lepage received the patent rights to develop helicopters patterned after the FW-61, and built the XR-1. Meanwhile, Sikorsky settled on a simpler, single rotor design, the VS-300, which turned out to be the first practical single lifting rotor helicopter design. After experimenting with configurations to counteract the torque produced by the single main rotor, Sikorsky settled on a single, smaller rotor mounted on the tail boom. Developed from the VS-300, Sikorsky's R-4 was the first large-scale mass-produced helicopter, with a production order for 100 aircraft. The R-4 was the only Allied helicopter to serve in World War II, when it was used primarily for search and rescue by the USAAF First Air Commando Group in Burma, in Alaska, and in other areas with harsh terrain. Total production reached 131 helicopters before the R-4 was replaced by other Sikorsky helicopters such as the R-5 and the R-6. In all, Sikorsky produced over 400 helicopters before the end of World War II, while Lepage and Sikorsky built their helicopters for the military. Bell Aircraft hired Arthur Young to help build a helicopter using Young's two blade teetering rotor design, which used a weighted stabilizer bar placed at a 90 degrees angle to the rotor blades. The subsequent Model 30 helicopter showed the design's simplicity and ease of use. The Model 30 was developed into the Bell 47, which became the first helicopter certified for civilian use in the United States. Produced in several countries, the Bell 47 was the most popular helicopter model for nearly 30 years. Topic. Turbine age In 1951, at the urging of his contacts at the Department of the Navy, Charles Command modified his K-225 Synchropter—a design for a twin-rotor helicopter concept first pioneered by Anton Fletner in 1939, with the aforementioned Florida 265 piston engine design in Germany with a new kind of engine, the turboshaft engine. 
This adaptation of the turbine engine provided a large amount of power to Command's helicopter with a lower weight penalty than piston engines, with their heavy engine blocks and auxiliary components. On the 11th of December 1951, the Command K225 became the first turbine-powered helicopter in the world. Two years later, on 26 March 1954, a modified Navy HTK-1, another Command helicopter, became the first twin turbine helicopter to fly. However, it was the Sud Aviation Alouette II that would become the first helicopter to be produced with a turbine engine. Reliable helicopters capable of stable hover flight were developed decades after fixed wing aircraft. This is largely due to higher engine power density requirements than fixed wing aircraft. Improvements in fuels and engines during the first half of the 20th century were a critical factor in helicopter development. The availability of lightweight turboshaft engines in the second half of the 20th century led to the development of larger, faster, and higher performance helicopters. While smaller and less expensive helicopters still use piston engines, turboshaft engines are the preferred power plant for helicopters today. Topic: <usas> Uses. Due to the operating characteristics of the helicopter, its ability to take off and land vertically, and to hover for extended periods of time, as well as the aircraft's handling properties under low airspeed conditions, it has been chosen to conduct tasks that were previously not possible with other aircraft, or were time or work intensive to accomplish on the ground. Today, helicopter uses include transportation of people and cargo, military uses, construction, firefighting, search and rescue, tourism, medical transport, law enforcement, agriculture, news and media, and aerial observation, among others. They can be used for reflection seismology or recreation. A helicopter used to carry loads connected to long cables or slings is called an aerial crane. Aerial cranes are used to place heavy equipment, like radio transmission towers and large air conditioning units, on the tops of tall buildings, or when an item must be raised up in a remote area, such as a radio tower raised on the top of a hill or mountain. Helicopters are used as aerial cranes in the logging industry to lift trees out of terrain where vehicles cannot travel and where environmental concerns prohibit the building of roads. These operations are referred to as longline because of the long, single sling line used to carry the load. The largest single non combat helicopter operation in history was the disaster management operation following the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Hundreds of pilots were involved in airdrop and observation missions, making dozens of sorties a day for several months. Hell attack is the use of helicopters to combat wildland fires. The helicopters are used for aerial firefighting water bombing, and may be fitted with tanks or carry helibuckets. Helibuckets, such as the Bambi bucket, are usually filled by submerging the bucket into lakes, rivers, reservoirs, or portable tanks. Tanks fitted onto helicopters are filled from a hose while the helicopter is on the ground or water is siphoned from lakes or reservoirs through a hanging snorkel as the helicopter hovers over the water source. Helitac helicopters are also used to deliver firefighters, who rappel down to inaccessible areas, and to resupply firefighters. Common firefighting helicopters include variants of the Bell 205 and the Ericsson S-64 aircrane helitanker. Helicopters are used as air ambulances for emergency medical assistance in situations when an ambulance cannot easily or quickly reach the scene, or cannot transport the patient to a medical facility in time. 
Helicopters are also used when patients need to be transported between medical facilities and air transportation is the most practical method. An air ambulance helicopter is equipped to stabilize and provide limited medical treatment to a patient while in flight. The use of helicopters as air ambulances is often referred to as MEDEVAC and patients are referred to as being airlifted or medivist. This use was pioneered in the Korean War, when time to reach a medical facility was reduced to three hours from the eight hours needed in World War II, and further reduced to two hours by the Vietnam War. Police departments and other law enforcement agencies use helicopters to pursue suspects. Since helicopters can achieve a unique aerial view, they are often used in conjunction with police on the ground to report on suspects' locations and movements. They are often mounted with lighting and heat sensing equipment for night pursuits. Military forces use attack helicopters to conduct aerial attacks on ground targets. Such helicopters are mounted with missile launchers and miniguns. Transport helicopters are used to ferry troops and supplies where the lack of an airstrip would make transport via fixed-wing aircraft impossible. The use of transport helicopters to deliver troops as an attack force on an objective is referred to as air assault. Unmanned aerial systems UAS helicopter systems of varying sizes are developed by companies for military reconnaissance and surveillance duties. Naval forces also use helicopters equipped with dipping sonar for anti-submarine warfare, since they can operate from small ships. Oil companies charter helicopters to move workers and parts quickly to remote drilling sites located at sea or in remote locations. The speed advantage over boats makes the high operating cost of helicopters cost effective in ensuring that oil platforms continue to operate. Various companies specialize in this type of operation. NASA is developing the Mars Helicopter Scout, a 1.8 kg helicopter to be launched to survey Mars along with a rover in 2020. Given that the Martian atmosphere is 100 times thinner than that of Earth's, its two blades will spin at close to 3,000 revolutions a minute, approximately 10 times faster than that of a terrestrial helicopter. Topic Market In 2017, 926 civil helicopters were shipped for $3.68 billion, led by Airbus helicopters with $1.87 billion for 369 rotorcraft, Leonardo helicopters with $806 million for 102 first three quarters only, Bell helicopter with $696 million for 132, then Robinson helicopter helicopter with $161 million for 305. By October 2018, the in-service and stored helicopter fleet of 38,570 with civil or government operators was led Robinson helicopter with 24.7% followed by Airbus helicopters with 24.4%, then Bell with 205 and Leonardo with 8.4%, Russian helicopters with 7.7%, Sikorsky aircraft with 7.2%, MD helicopters with 3.4% and other with 2.2%. The most widespread model is the piston Robinson R44 with 5,600, then the H125, AS350 with 3,600 units, followed by the Bell 206 with 3,400. 
Most were in North America with 34.3% then in Europe with 28.0% followed by Asia Pacific with 18.6%, Latin America with 11.6%, Africa with 5.3% and Middle East with 1.7%. Design features Rotor system The rotor system, or more simply rotor, is the rotating part of a helicopter that generates lift. A rotor system may be mounted horizontally, as main rotors are, providing lift vertically, or it may be mounted vertically, such as a tail rotor, to provide horizontal thrust to counteract torque from the main rotors. The rotor consists of a mast, hub and rotor blades. The mast is a cylindrical metal shaft that extends upwards from the transmission. At the top of the mast is the attachment point for the rotor blades called the hub. The rotor blades are attached to the hub. Main rotor systems are classified according to how the rotor blades are attached and move relative to the hub. There are three basic types, hingeless, fully articulated, and teetering, although some modern rotor systems use a combination of these. Anti-torque Most helicopters have a single main rotor, but torque created by its aerodynamic drag must be counted by an opposed torque. The design that Igor Sikorsky settled on for his VS-300 was a smaller tail rotor. The tail rotor pushes or pulls against the tail to counter the torque effect, and this has become the most common configuration for helicopter design, usually at the end of a tail boom. Some helicopters use other anti-torque controls instead of the tail rotor, such as the ducted fan called fenestrin or fantail and notar. Notar provides anti-torque similar to the way a wing develops lift through the use of the coander effect on the tail boom. The use of two or more horizontal rotors turning in opposite directions is another configuration used to counteract the effects of torque on the aircraft without relying on an anti-torque tail rotor. This allows the power normally required to drive the tail rotor to be applied to the main rotors, increasing the aircraft's lifting capacity. There are several common configurations that use the counter-rotating effect to benefit the rotorcraft. Tandem rotors are two counter-rotating rotors with one mounted behind the other. Coaxial rotors are two counter-rotating rotors mounted one above the other with the same axis. Intermeshing rotors are two counter-rotating rotors mounted close to each other at a sufficient angle to let the rotors intermesh over the top of the aircraft without colliding. Transverse rotors are a pair of counter-rotating rotors mounted at each end of the wings or outrigger structures. Now used on tilt rotors, some early model helicopters had used them. Quadcopters have four rotors often with parallel axes sometimes rotating in the same direction with tilted axes which are commonly used on model aircraft. Tip jet designs let the rotor push itself through the air and avoid generating torque. Topic Engines The number, size and type of engines used on a helicopter determines the size, function and capability of that helicopter design. The earliest helicopter engines were simple mechanical devices, such as rubber bands or spindles, which relegated the size of helicopters to toys and small models. 
For a half century before the first airplane flight, steam engines were used to forward the development of the understanding of helicopter aerodynamics, but the limited power did not allow for manned flight. The introduction of the internal combustion engine at the end of the 19th century became the watershed for helicopter development as engines began to be developed and produced that were powerful enough to allow for helicopters able to lift humans. Early helicopter designs utilized custom built engines or rotary engines designed for airplanes, but these were soon replaced by more powerful automobile engines and radial engines. The single, most limiting factor of helicopter development during the first half of the 20th century was that the amount of power produced by an engine was not able to overcome the engine's weight in vertical flight. This was overcome in early successful helicopters by using the smallest engines available. When the compact, flat engine was developed, the helicopter industry found a lighter weight power plant easily adapted to small helicopters. Although radial engines continued to be used for larger helicopters, turbine engines revolutionized the aviation industry, and the turboshaft engine finally gave helicopters an engine with a large amount of power and a low weight penalty. Turboshafts are also more reliable than piston engines, especially when producing the sustained high levels of power required by a helicopter. The turboshaft engine was able to be scaled to the size of the helicopter being designed, so that all but the lightest of helicopter models are powered by turbine engines today. Special jet engines developed to drive the rotor from the rotor tips are referred to as tip jets. Tip jets powered by a remote compressor are referred to as cold tip jets, while those powered by combustion exhaust are referred to as hot tip jets. An example of a cold jet helicopter is the Sud West Gin, and an example of the hot tip jet helicopter is the YH 32 Hornet. Some radio controlled helicopters and smaller, helicopter type unmanned aerial vehicles use electric motors. Radio-controlled helicopters may also have piston engines that use fuels other than gasoline, such as nitromethane. Some turbine engines commonly used in helicopters can also use biodiesel instead of jet fuel. There are also human-powered helicopters. Topic: <laughs> Flight controls. A helicopter has four flight control inputs. These are the cyclic, the collective, the anti-torque pedals, and the throttle. The cyclic control is usually located between the pilot's legs and is commonly called the cyclic stick or just cyclic. On most helicopters, the cyclic is similar to a joystick. However, the Robinson R-22 and Robinson R-44 have a unique teetering bar cyclic control system and a few helicopters have a cyclic control that descends into the cockpit from overhead. The control is called the cyclic because it changes the pitch of the rotor blades cyclically. The result is to tilt the rotor disc in a particular direction, resulting in the helicopter moving in that direction. If the pilot pushes the cyclic forward, the rotor disc tilts forward, and the rotor produces a thrust in the forward direction. If the pilot pushes the cyclic to the side, the rotor disc tilts to that side and produces thrust in that direction, causing the helicopter to hover sideways. The collective pitch control or collective is located on the left side of the pilot's seat with a settable friction control to prevent inadvertent movement. The collective changes the pitch angle of all the main rotor blades collectively i.e. all at the same time and independently of their position. Therefore, if a collective input is made, all the blades change equally, and the result is the helicopter increasing or decreasing in altitude. 
The anti-torque pedals are located in the same position as the rudder pedals in a fixed-wing aircraft, and serve a similar purpose, namely to control the direction in which the nose of the aircraft is pointed. Application of the pedal in a given direction changes the pitch of the tail rotor blades, increasing or reducing the thrust produced by the tail rotor and causing the nose to yaw in the direction of the applied pedal. The pedals mechanically change the pitch of the tail rotor altering the amount of thrust produced. Helicopter rotors are designed to operate in a narrow range of RPM. The throttle controls the power produced by the engine, which is connected to the rotor by a fixed ratio transmission. The purpose of the throttle is to maintain enough engine power to keep the rotor RPM within allowable limits so that the rotor produces enough lift for flight. In single-engine helicopters, the throttle control is a motorcycle-style twist grip mounted on the collective control, while dual-engine helicopters have a power lever for each engine. A swashplate controls the collective and cyclic pitch of the main blades. The swashplate moves up and down, along the main shaft, to change the pitch of both blades. This causes the helicopter to push air downward or upward, depending on the angle of attack. The swashplate can also change its angle to move the blade's angle forwards or backwards, or left and right, to make the helicopter move in those directions. <laughs> Flight There are three basic flight conditions for a helicopter, hover, forward flight and the transition between the two. <laughs> hover Hovering is the most challenging part of flying a helicopter. This is because a helicopter generates its own gusty air while in a hover, which acts against the fuselage and flight control surfaces. The end result is constant control inputs and corrections by the pilot to keep the helicopter where it is required to be. Despite the complexity of the task, the control inputs in a hover are simple. The cyclic is used to eliminate drift in the horizontal plane, that is to control forward and back, right and left. The collective is used to maintain altitude. The pedals are used to control nose direction or heading. It is the interaction of these controls that makes hovering so difficult, since an adjustment in any one control requires an adjustment of the other two, creating a cycle of constant correction. Topic. Transition from hover to forward flight As a helicopter moves from hover to forward flight it enters a state called translational lift which provides extra lift without increasing power. This state, most typically, occurs when the airspeed reaches approximately 16 to 24 knots 30 to 44 km per hour, 18 to 28 miles per hour, and may be necessary for a helicopter to obtain flight. Topic. Forward flight In forward flight a helicopter's flight controls behave more like those of a fixed-wing aircraft. Displacing the cyclic forward will cause the nose to pitch down, with a resultant increase in airspeed and loss of altitude. Aft cyclic will cause the nose to pitch up, slowing the helicopter and causing it to climb. Increasing collective power while maintaining a constant airspeed will induce a climb while decreasing collective will cause a descent. Coordinating these two inputs, down collective plus aft cyclic or up collective plus forward cyclic, will result in airspeed changes while maintaining a constant altitude. 
The pedals serve the same function in both a helicopter and a fixed-wing aircraft, to maintain balanced flight. This is done by applying a pedal input in whichever direction is necessary to center the ball in the turn and bank indicator. Safety Topic: Maximum speed limit The main limitation of the helicopter is its low speed. There are several reasons a helicopter cannot fly as fast as a fixed-wing aircraft. When the helicopter is hovering, the outer tips of the rotor travel at a speed determined by the length of the blade and the rotational speed. In a moving helicopter, however, the speed of the blades relative to the air depends on the speed of the helicopter as well as on their rotational speed. The airspeed of the advancing rotor blade is much higher than that of the helicopter itself. It is possible for this blade to exceed the speed of sound, and thus produce vastly increased drag and vibration. At the same time, the advancing blade creates more lift traveling forward, the retreating blade produces less lift. If the aircraft were to accelerate to the air speed that the blade tips are spinning, the retreating blade passes through air moving at the same speed of the blade and produces no lift at all, resulting in very high torque stresses on the central shaft that can tip down the retreating blade side of the vehicle, and cause a loss of control. Dual counter-rotating blades prevent this situation due to having two advancing and two retreating blades with balanced forces. Because the advancing blade has higher airspeed than the retreating blade and generates a dissymmetry of lift, rotor blades are designed to flap, lift and twist in such a way that the advancing blade flaps up and develops a smaller angle of attack. Conversely, the retreating blade flaps down, develops a higher angle of attack, and generates more lift. At high speeds, the force on the rotors is such that they flap excessively, and the retreating blade can reach too high an angle and stall. For this reason, the maximum safe forward airspeed of a helicopter is given a design rating called VNE, velocity, never exceed. In addition, it is possible for the helicopter to fly at an airspeed where an excessive amount of the retreating blade stalls, which results in high vibration, pitch up, and roll into the retreating blade. <laughs> <laughs> Noise During the closing years of the 20th century designers began working on helicopter noise reduction. Urban communities have often expressed great dislike of noisy aviation or noisy aircraft, and police and passenger helicopters can be unpopular because of the sound. The redesigns followed the closure of some city heliports and government action to constrain flight paths in national parks and other places of natural beauty. Vibration Helicopters also vibrate, an unadjusted helicopter can easily vibrate so much that it will shake itself apart. To reduce vibration, all helicopters have rotor adjustments for height and weight. Blade height is adjusted by changing the pitch of the blade. Weight is adjusted by adding or removing weights on the rotor head and or at the blade end caps. Most also have vibration dampers for height and pitch. Some also use mechanical feedback systems to sense and counter vibration. Usually the feedback system uses a mass as a stable reference, and a linkage from the mass operates a flap to adjust the rotor's angle of attack to counter the vibration. 
Adjustment is difficult in part because measurement of the vibration is hard, usually requiring sophisticated accelerometers mounted throughout the airframe and gearboxes. The most common blade vibration adjustment measurement system is to use a stroboscopic flash lamp, and observe painted markings or colored reflectors on the underside of the rotor blades. The traditional low-tech system is to mount colored chalk on the rotor tips, and see how they mark a linen sheet. Gearbox vibration most often requires a gearbox overhaul or replacement. Gearbox or drive train vibrations can be extremely harmful to a pilot. The most severe being pain, numbness, loss of tactile discrimination and dexterity. Topic: <laughs> Loss of tail rotor effectiveness. For a standard helicopter with a single main rotor, the tips of the main rotor blades produce a vortex ring in the air, which is a spiraling and circularly rotating airflow. As the craft moves forward, these vortices trail off behind the craft. When hovering with a forward diagonal crosswind, or moving in a forward diagonal direction, the spinning vortices trailing off the main rotor blades will align with the rotation of the tail rotor and cause an instability in flight control. When the trailing vortices colliding with the tail rotor are rotating in the same direction, this causes a loss of thrust from the tail rotor. When the trailing vortices rotate in the opposite direction of the tail rotor, thrust is increased. Use of the foot pedals is required to adjust the tail rotor's angle of attack, to compensate for these instabilities. These issues are due to the exposed tail rotor cutting through open air around rear of the vehicle. This issue disappears when the tail is instead ducted, using an internal impeller enclosed in the tail and a jet of high-pressure air sideways out of the tail, as the main rotor vortices can not impact the operation of an internal impeller. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Critical wind azimuth. For a standard helicopter with a single main rotor, maintaining steady flight with a crosswind presents an additional flight control problem, where strong crosswinds from certain angles will increase or decrease lift from the main rotors. This effect is also triggered in a no-wind condition when moving the craft diagonally in various directions, depending on the direction of main rotor rotation, this can lead to a loss of control and a crash or hard landing when operating at low altitudes, due to the sudden unexpected loss of lift, and insufficient time and distance available to recover. Transmission Conventional rotary wing aircraft use a set of complex mechanical gearboxes to convert the high rotation speed of gas turbines into the low speed required to drive main and tail rotors. Unlike power plants, mechanical gearboxes cannot be duplicated for redundancy and have always been a major weak point in helicopter reliability. In-flight catastrophic gear failures often result in gearbox jamming and subsequent fatalities, whereas loss of lubrication can trigger onboard fire. Another weakness of mechanical gearboxes is their transient power limitation, due to structural fatigue limits. Recent ASA studies point to engines and transmissions as prime cause of crashes just after pilot errors. By contrast, electromagnetic transmissions do not use any parts in contact, hence, lubrication can be drastically simplified or eliminated. Their inherent redundancy offers good resilience to single point of failure. The absence of gears enables high power transient without impact on service life. 
The concept of electric propulsion applied to helicopter and electromagnetic drive was brought to reality by Pascal Chrétien who designed, built and flew world's first man-carrying, free-flying electric helicopter. The concept was taken from the conceptual computer-aided design model on 10 September 2010 to the first testing at 30% power on 1 March 2011 less than 6 months the aircraft first flew on the 12th of august 2011 all development was conducted in venelles france topic <laughs> hazards <laughs> 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 As with any moving vehicle, unsafe operation could result in loss of control, structural damage, or loss of life. The following is a list of some of the potential hazards for helicopters. Settling with power is when the aircraft has insufficient power to arrest its descent. This hazard can develop into vortex ring state if not corrected early. Vortex ring state is a hazard induced by a combination of low airspeed, high power setting, and high descent rate. Rotor tip vortices circulate from the high pressure air below the rotor disc to low pressure air above the disc, so that the helicopter settles into its own descending airflow. Adding more power increases the rate of air circulation and aggravates the situation. It is sometimes confused with settling with power, but they are aerodynamically different. Retreating blade stall is experienced during high-speed flight and is the most common limiting factor of a helicopter's forward speed. Ground resonance is a self-reinforcing vibration that occurs when the lead, lag spacing of the blades of an articulated rotor system becomes irregular. Low G condition is an abrupt change from a positive G force state to a negative G force state that results in loss of lift, unloaded disc and subsequent rollover. If aft cyclic is applied while the disc is unloaded, the main rotor could strike the tail causing catastrophic failure. Dynamic rollover in which the helicopter pivots around one of the skids and pulls itself onto its side almost like a fixed wing aircraft ground loop. Powertrain failures, especially those that occur within the shaded area of the height velocity diagram. Tail rotor failures which occur from either a mechanical malfunction of the tail rotor control system or a loss of tail rotor thrust authority, called loss of tail rotor effectiveness, LTE. Brownout in dusty conditions or whiteout in snowy conditions. Low rotor RPM, or rotor droop is when the engine cannot drive the blades at sufficient RPM to maintain flight. Rotor overspeed, which can overstress the rotor hub pitch bearings and, if severe enough, cause blade separation from the aircraft. Wire and tree strikes due to low altitude operations and takeoffs and landings in remote locations. Controlled flight into terrain in which the aircraft is flown into the ground unintentionally due to a lack of situational awareness. Mast bumping in some helicopters <laughs> <laughs> Deadliest crashes World records equals equals see also